No. Hello. Excellent. Go for it, Pete. All right. Welcome to our presentation. Wow, I moves. Um, it's uh, revolving around uh, printers and using them during assessments. I'm Pete. This is Daryl. Uh, we've worked together for several years. We work right now together at Rapid7 where we're on the assessment team and we do you know, all kinds of uh, assessment work, pen tests, mobile apps, all that kind of fun stuff. A um, little unknown fact about Daryl, he actually won the Beard and Mustache contest the first time they hit at DEF CON. Um, so we've been doing this type of stuff for... All right. So we've been uh, working together on this type of stuff for, for a long time. So I'll let kind of Daryl jump in here and talk about the agenda for, for today. Okay, uh, uh, today's agenda, we're focusing on uh, interacting with multifunction printers within the corporate or business environment. Uh, the goal here is, is we're going to have some pen testing examples. Uh, our team uses this stuff quite often. Uh, previous team I worked with did that also. We're going to show several cool methods on extracting data. We're going to talk about uh, reducing risk, and we're also going to talk about automating this attack uh, methodology. Some of the uh, common failures when we're dealing with multifunction devices are a simple default passwords, a uh, common problem with any kind of embedded device that you run into uh, within a corporate environment. Uh, no patch management. So when I do find a vulnerability and I report it out there, uh, you guys are not actually patching it once the vendor actually releases something because those things are not within the radar screen of being patched. Uh, lack of understanding. Every company I go into and I basically hand them their Active Directory domain admin creds that I pulled off a multifunction printer, they go, this stuff's on a multifunction printer. A multifunction printer has a web interface. I can steal stuff? Yes. They don't know about it. And interesting enough, even in the uh, security community, security professionals don't know about this stuff. They're just befuddled and shocked every time they see a presentation that we've done on this particular subject. And then also poor product design and vulnerabilities associated with products. So uh, what can we steal from printers? Well, the main thing I'm always after is usernames and passwords. That is totally cool to be able to get that stuff off a printer to escalate your rights within a corporate or business environment. So let's start off with talking about some uh, password failures. This is kind of interesting. So uh, this is the default password for, for Xerox, most of your work centers. It's simple. It's 1111. Uh, and what happens is really funny is, Rarely is it ever changed, but once in a while you'll encounter a company where they'll actually change the password, okay? And every one I've actually encountered has always changed it to another four-digit PIN. Not even alphanumeric, all numeric, four-digit PIN, and it's always higher than 1111. How long do you think it's going to take to brute force that? Not much time at all, so it's easy to get around that stuff. Also, uh, the work center is, uh, I released uh, some exploit information and white papers on actually extracting uh, data through the work centers and gaining root level access to the devices through uh, firmware injection attacks. So even if you change your password, I can pull it off the device. And we've actually automated that in our tool to do that also. Uh, Ricos, uh, by default, have no passwords. So what do you do if someone actually sets the password on it? It's fairly simple. Um, you actually log on with the supervisor account. Ha! There's a backdoor account on these systems. To start with, you're never going to find the, uh, you're never actually going to find, looking at the RICO system, any indication that there's another identity on there called supervisor. The only way to see that account or configure that account is you have to log on with that account. Pretty straightforward. And the only thing that account could do is reset the password for admin. It's its whole purpose. So I was on a Rico uh, on a on a message board that I often hunt haunt to uh, get information on stealing stuff off these devices, and it was a quote from one of the Rico technicians when he's talking about the supervisor thing. Well, he didn't say supervisor; he said the backdoor account. Hence, never tell your customer about the supervisor. Well, I guess he did say not supervisor account. What they don't know will not hurt them. As simple as that. So it's this big secret. They don't want to tell anyone. Uh, for you to actually protect yourself. Yes? It's not even a default password to supervisor. You say supervisor blank password. Yes, no password. Blank password okay. default. Okay. You can set you okay. can okay. set you, you can set a password on supervisor. Okay? 
but you have to log in as supervisor to set the password as supervisor, or, or you'll never know the account's there. So no one actually knows the account actually exists on the system. So, and then the Toshiba. Uh, this one here is probably not really what I consider a, a password issue or problem, but it turns out that uh, you can bypass, now this is passed on the, the newest Toshibas. So if you go back more than anything produced more than three years ago, uh, that has never been patched or upgraded, all you have to do is actually add an extra slash between top access administrator and completely bypass all the security on the device. Um, and what you can do with this is that, that link right there, that link right there will actually take you to a thing called generallist.htm, uh, which is the administrative setup, I believe. In this case here, you can actually look at the source once you get to that page, and it'll actually pull out of the HTML source the actual password for the administrator account that it's been set to. It's actually in the, in the actual code. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and here's a few default passwords. Like I said, default passwords is a big thing. Uh, fairly straightforward. The Chiba, uh, the one, two, three, four, five, six, admin, one, 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 you know, the Canon image runner advanced devices, it's, uh, user seven, six, five, three, two, one, such, and same way with the Konica. Uh, so they're fairly easy to remember and no one ever changes these things. So it's, it's kind of interesting what you can do. So from this point, I'm going to turn it over to Pete and he's going to start talking about some pen testing. So now we establish that passwords suck on printers, right? We also establish that people don't patch printers. You put your printer, you set it, it prints, no one ever cares, as long as it's printed. And we also found that uh, when designing the UIs for the printers, people really don't take security you know, into mind, like Daryl was saying. Some of the printers, you can just go through the source code and start seeing passwords just stored in a hidden field. Ooh, it has stars, it's secure, no. Um, so now that we know how to get to this information, how can we leverage it on a pen test? What can we do? to take this information, to get a foothold in an environment, and then possibly take over the entire environment. So we're going to cover three examples of how Daryl and I have used printers in corporate environments, some small, some large, to gain uh, DA access, to get that domain level access and, and take over things. The first example we're going to go over is uh, what we call a passback attack. So you ask the printer nicely, hey, give me your creds. And it says, okay, here you go. The second one we'll look at is going over uh, the Canon address book, extracting passwords out of the address book from the Canon system. And then the third one will be harvesting user IDs for other uh, brute force attacks against the environment. So we'll jump into our, our first story. So this first example, it was a large energy company. Most of the systems were well passed. So you're not gonna, you, we didn't find any of that, you know, MS-067 laying around, no SASA, you know, all the, the typical stuff that you would see. So we had to get a little bit creative to, to compromise the environment. Most of the desktops are Windows 7 and Vista. Yes, people actually do run Vista in a production environment. Sad but true. Um, servers were a mix of 2003 and 2008, so you know, a lot, a lot of good stuff going on. They've had prior assessments doing a, a bunch of stuff right. So how the methodology that we use to kind of discover this stuff is there's two kind of processes automated. So we'll use like Nmap to go through and search for specific ports that are commonly used for printers. You know, port 80, 443, uh, 8080, 881. These are usually where the management interfaces are going to be. And then in this instance, uh, for some reason I wasn't able to use Prada. Um, what I did is uh, wrote a script that would take the Nmap output, run it through um, this uh, WKHTML to image, and snapshot each of the printers, and then create an index file so I can quickly go through and identify which printers that they had in the organization, which ones I want to target for attack, which ones are going to have, you know, that golden nugget that I want. So using this data, I found a, a nice Xerox color cube. Um, after I found that, it's, it's game on. Now, and now it's over with. Like Daryl was saying, factory credentials. One, 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 one. One, 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 one. Got me in. I'm like, oh, great, cool. Let's, you know, see what kind of stuff you have configured here. Let's see what we can get out of this. So going through the configurations, looking at what was set up on there, they were using um, LDAP authentication to populate their address book to do, you know, send a, uh, a scan in, send it to uh, an email address, that kind of fun stuff. So looking over the LDAP configuration, what we did is we used what was called uh, a passback at uh, attack. So we used the LDAP account that's used to talk to um, the exchange server to get the information of, about the email accounts. We tricked it into sending us the credentials instead of the uh, Exchange server, and we'll go through uh, more detail on kind of how that works and show you uh, the steps that need to be taken to do that. And then at the end of the day, we ended up automating a lot of this in our, in our tool, Prada. 
So once I got the accounts off there, uh, I found out that the account had access to a workstation. And then from there, you know, everybody knows the same song and dance. Start dumping the local hashes, and then start seeing if those hashes work somewhere else, exploiting that tr uh, type of trust relationship. So the trust relationship not only deals with, you know, your common servers and workstations, but also any other type of devices that may communicate with that. So printers, who would think printers could be used to violate trust relationships between an organization? That local administrator account, you know, has found on other systems, and then finally found the system that had a domain token, and then bam, domain admin access. All started from a printer that somebody uses just to send emails, or uh, scan stuff in and send it to somebody's email box. A printer that no one really cares about unless it's not working. They don't go through and change some of the stuff. So now we'll kind of go into the, the actual attack scenario and how we leverage this and kind of how the LDAP passback attack works. So these attacks work on, on a lot of, most all multi-function players. Um, there hasn't been one so far that's been configured that we weren't able to, to leverage this attack. So what we do is we leverage the actual authentication system. So not only is there LDAP authentication, you can also scan to a file server. You can also um, have it sync up with your mail services, your SNTP and your POP3 and then also FTP stuff. So all of these have some sort of authentication mechanism that you can use to talk to whatever end device that you're using. So we're gonna focus on the LDAP one because that's the one that's most commonly used and that's the one that we see most commonly set up. It's often set up to, uh, to go against Active Directory to pull in that address book information. Um, and then uh, <laughs> once you get it, you can extract valid Active Directory credentials. So that gives you that foothold that you need. So passback overview. So you have your printer, right? And you have your LDAP server. You configure it to say, hey, look, here are my credentials, username, and password. Talk to the LDAP server, says, I need you know, all the email accounts that you guys have. And the LDAP server says, oh, your credentials are good, here you go. So what we do is like, hey, we're red, we're deal guys. So we're like, well, let me change your LDAP server IP. I am not your LDAP server, I will give you what you need. And the printer says, oh, okay. So then what we do is we say, hey, look, I need to find this address. Bam, sends us credentials. So here's an example of the, the actual uh, color cube. As you see here underneath the properties, so I'm logged into this admin already, default password 1111. The LDAP configuration here, so you can see the, the friendly name of whatever the LDAP server is, and then the actual IP address and port number. A lot of times, it's just gonna be using clear text. It's not gonna be using uh, secure LDAP, so you're not seeing any SSL, and if needed, you can handle some of the SSL conversation, uh, communication back when we talk about actually getting the, the credentials back. And then towards the bottom, you'll see that the user account, and this is actually, uh, the stuff that's been blurred out is to protect the innocent, so this is from a valid assessment that we used, uh, the attack on, so you can see the domain was there, and then the actual account. Here you don't see the, the password, uh, no stars or anything like that. The password is there, it is configured with the password. That's kind of their way of doing security is not showing a password at all. Uh, but if you look at the code, they, they are handling it correctly. They handle it uh, off the actual page, so it's not really uh, easily scraped out of there. So we had to come up with a way to get that information. So how can we do that? So what we do is we reconfigure that IP address to point to our system saying, I'm your LDAP server. Send me your stuff, I got the goods. And then what we do is once we configure it, we go into the user mapping section so we can trigger an actual query to make the system say, okay, I got a new uh, LDAP server, now give me the goods, I need to populate my address book. So then what we do is underneath uh, search, we just put a fictitious, you know, foo, search. All that is is so that it triggers that LDAP query to say, hey, let's start talking, let's be friends, let's exchange stuff. So how do we get this information? How do we get these credentials in a format that we can use? Well, simple. Just start up a Netcat listener. I'm sitting listening for a 389. You have the server already trying to talk to you. You trigger that LDAP lookup, and bam, there we go. So now we have a username and a valid password, all set in clear text. You don't have to crack anything, simple as pie. What could be easier than doing this and then gaining access? And most of the times what we're, we see is, you know, these accounts are, are privileged accounts, especially if they're using like FTP or if you find that that nice printer in the HR department, because they have to have something fancy, right? It's HR. Well, they're saving that stuff off to their file server. Now you have access to HR information. Now you have PII information, any other type of stuff that an HR organization or an HR department would have. So bam, we have domain credentials. 
it's kind of the moral of the story is <laughs> multi-function printers are so fun to play with. They're so easy to attack. A lot of the security controls that you would see in normal software are not put in printers because, you know, it's a printer. No one can do anything bad with a printer. Come on. We can set it on fire, but really, what else can you do? So I never, never assume that a printer can't be used against you. And then, you know, the, the biggest thing that you'll hear Daryl and I, you know, beating the drums on is change those default passwords. I mean, a lot of them are all documented on the internet. You'll, you know, just look up Xerox default password. Bam. You have like 30 links from Google saying, here's what it is, here's what it is, here's what it is. Uh, pretty much every printer out there that we've run across, there's documentation on what the default password is. Um, and then also, if, if you're going to do some of these more complicated functions like save stuff off, do LDAP queries, stuff like that, make sure it's a very limited account, and that's all that thing can do. All it can do is query the LDAP server. It's not logged in on any systems. It doesn't have access to any systems. So you're kind of mitigating the risk as much as possible by limiting what type of access that uh, system has. And if there's any questions like during any of these attacks, you know, just feel free to ask. We'll keep this pretty dynamic. So now we're going to go into the second story where Dale will take over here and kind of go over this, this attack. Thanks. Pretty neat one. So uh, the second story, uh, this was kind of interesting. Uh, just going to go over uh, the, the environment I was dealing with and what I was able to accomplish. And then we're going to get into the actual appliances, into some details so we can actually see uh, this attack method. Um, and, and the vendors attempt, to, it's funny, the vendors attempt to stop me specifically. Uh, because they recoded the way they were doing stuff on their new Canon devices based on stuff that I published. Um, but then we're going to show you how to violate the changes that they did make, at least a couple of them, uh, which is kind of funny. So I was dealing with the city government. This was, this was kind of cool. So I show up at the city government office, and their stuff's patched. You know, um, Most of their business office stuff, I could not get anything. Every server had a different password. Most of the users had complex passwords, so there was none of this summer 10, summer 13, summer 14 silly passwords. They all had complex passwords. So brute force password attacks did not work either. Uh, also, there were a full Windows 2008, Windows 7 environment. And the one thing I didn't put on here, it also the users' administrator rights, they didn't have administrative rights to their own system. The big thing is, is the administrator account on all the client machines was disabled. So literally, what can I gain access to? I was on site for three days. I spent two, two, two days trying to hack everything. I'm getting nowhere. So then it was like, well, it's time to look at the printers. So after this gig, I started looking at the printers when I walked through the door <laughs> instead of waiting until the end of the engagement. So in this particular case, uh, you know, there's a couple methods like Pete had mentioned, manual and automated. Uh, in my case, uh, the automated method is a tool we wrote called Preda. We're going to talk about that a little later on here. So I can do a GN map or in map of the entire organization and take the GN map output and feed that right into Preda and it'll automatically crawl your environment and look for devices that we've written attack modules for. So in this case here, we found several Canon image runners. Uh, we needed to export those address books because there's good stuff in Canon address books, really good stuff. Uh, in this case, they actually had a password set. But the good thing was is they hadn't patched their patches or patched their Canon, so there was no, this, this had been fixed in newer patches. They hadn't done that. And we're also looking at the uh, Canon image runners, not the image runner advanced, which we'll talk about too in a little bit. So there was a password on this system, but turns out that there is also a forced browsing attack that can be used to bypass um, authentication on these devices. Uh, in this case here, I pulled the address book and was able to extract Corp City Admin as a user ID and the password for it, and it turned out to be a domain admin account. So I went to the director that day, because he, he was like, he was puffed up all the way. God, you're not getting anything. You're not going to break into me. And I goes, is this your domain admin? Or I said, hey, you want to look at your domain? Because I created my own domain admin account. He's like, well, how would you do that? And I showed him I did it with his printers. He was pissed. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. He was just pissed. Uh, he, he, he took it in stride, but he was pissed. All of his work, all of his effort, completely derailed 100% with a multifunction printer. So let's go ahead and have a deeper examination of this. Uh, like I said, there's the Canon IR devices. Default, no password on the, on the old IRs. Uh, you can do forceful browsing if 
to get access to various functions on it, if it does have a password. Um, and then you can export stuff out of the address books in plain text, and you can get the passwords. The other devices we're going to talk about is the IR Advance. This is ones where they went in and made a lot of changes based on the evil crap that I did to them before. Uh, they set a, a default credentials and passwords on the device. They also uh, set it up that passwords are not exported by default in the address books. You have to select that function. And then the passwords are actually encrypted when they're exported in the address book. Well, we got a fix for that too. So, uh, so let's go ahead and look at the IR and how we're able to get past that. Uh, like I said, you must, act, add, you must extract the address books to get the password. So if you go into one of these printers and you look at the address books, you're not going to see anything. There's nothing there. You have to do an export function to get this data. So you can force browsing, and the way this is done, if you try to just go to the address books in a force browsing attack, it will fail. You will not get access to it. But if you hit the home page of the web server of it first, it assigns you a session cookie. It's an unauthenticated session cookie, but it's still a session cookie. With that session cookie, now you can get the address books without authenticating. Oh, it's total fail, but that's, that's beside the point. Uh, <laughs> Like I said, that's how you do it. You get that, and, and you can get up to 11 address books can be configured in it. So this is, the, this is the URL. So you basically hit the site, get a session cookie assigned, and then you use this URL, and you basically increment the AID setting up to go through all 11 books in order. So you can pull 11 address books out that way. And this happens to be the extract of the address book from uh, that organization, and you can see the path where this scan the file functionality was configured for, uh, the city admin, which turned out to be a domain admin, and the actual password in plain text in the address books that were exported on a printer that had a password set on it so I shouldn't get access. It all failed because they were not patching their devices. This is where they failed here. Okay, so let's go on to the Canon ADV IR, the uh, advanced versions of the image runner. So uh, they fixed the forced browsing attack. So that, that kind of, well, that's a good thing. We, it's all about security, not insecurity. So, so they went ahead and they fixed the uh, forced browsing, so that didn't work anymore. Uh, they set default passwords on the device. Passwords are not exported by default in the address books. And when the passwords are exported, they're exported encrypted. So let's dig into that. Okay, here we are. We're at the ADV. So you've seen the slides. What's the username and password? Quick. All right, yeah, people paying attention. Okay, now we're in the system. And uh, you can do a lot of hunting in here and find crap. This whole interface was just so freaking confusing, it was amazing. But if we come over here to settings and registration, we'll bring up this site here. Over here, we go to address book export settings. So we can tell it to export certain functions. In this case, it actually has a checkbox. Include passwords when exporting address books. So we go in there and we, we can click on that. And then we go ahead and go OK. And then we come down here to data management, go over this, and then we want to go import export. Now, when you go import export, it's going to prompt you for a password. That password is going to be to decrypt the password if you need to reload it back in. OK? So it gives you this right here. So we can see uh, it, it, the, the passwords are encrypted. Of course, they've been base64 because encryption is going to be binary data. So the only way to store it properly is to base64, but it is an encrypted password. I do not know the encryption mechanism. I never bothered to find out. Uh, they gave me a way around that. So if we come over here and we fire up a burp or any kind of a, a proxy, web proxy, and we capture the post transaction, we can see this ENC mode. ENC, what do you think that means? How about encryption mode? They're letting us have control over the encryption mode. So it's set at two. What happens if I set it at zero? How about the password in plain text? So, and we've we've actually uh, automated a, a, a good bit of these things that you're seeing here. We're discussing today. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, the moral. There's always a moral to a story. The moral of the story is never assume your printers can't be used against you. Uh, and there's a high. Uh, a, uh, attack ratio. We have a high efficiency attack ratio. We're very good at this. It works way a lot. And we're actually going to, toward the end of the presentation, we'll cover some of the statistics of this project since we started it uh, 
four years ago, three years ago, uh, where it started at and where it came to and how effective this method is. And, and don't give your printer's domain admin privileges. Come on, the solution to fixing something that isn't working isn't making it a domain admin. We just need to get people to stop doing that. Or you can keep doing it. It does make my job a lot easier. So uh, go ahead and turn the next story over to Pete. All right, so our last example is uh, about information disclosure. So it's not really grabbing passwords or anything like that, but it's using information that you can gain from the printer to attack the environment. So the customer environment was a media science bank, um, well-patched, you know, workstation servers, you know, kind of uh, the theme so far. Um, they've gone through several assessments before, you know, we got our hands on it. Um, so they've been through all the low-hanging fruit. They've done their patching. They have a patch management system. Um, they're doing all the, you know, the things that they should be doing. So a uh, very uh, security active company. So as soon as, you know, they get uh, a finding ban, they're fixing it. So, I mean, they're, they're on top of their game. So it was kind of uh, fun to, to take these guys down and kind of show them that, hey, look, just because your workstations or your, your typical things that you think about securing are, are, are good, there's always these other line things that are connected to your network that you got to think about. You got to think about, you know, the things outside the box, the things that um, are used in common uh, things like, you know, any type of uh, HVAC systems, printers, that type of stuff. So they were, you know, very confident that, yeah, you guys are going to get in this year. There's no way you guys can get in. So uh, I was really fun to, <laughs> to pull this off on them. So um, once again, two different types of attack methods. So we automated it using Nmap, taking the Nmap data and then passing it to Preda. And Preda going off and saying, okay, let's, let's start looking at this stuff and uh, start getting information that we can use in the assessment. Um, Fortunately for them, they didn't have any type of large multifunction printers that we were able to access, or the ones that they did have weren't configured to do anything like uh, scan the file or LDAP uh, uh, address book synchronization. So we had to kind of look at other stuff on the printers, like what can we use here to help us gain access. So going through the, the data, we found uh, ColorJet. Uh, most everybody here has seen like an HP ColorJet. So when you use the color functionality on a ColorJet, what do you guys see? You see the name of the application and then a username. That's typically set up so if they want to build back different departments for the color users because, you know, color toner is expensive, they have that functionality within a printer, which is, you know, helpful for them, also helpful for us. So we extract those usernames from that color job, uh, the color job log. And this is just not uh, centered on HP. Uh, a lot of other printers, and I'll have an example of a Xerox here, that log this information. And once again, it's so they can use it for build back. So well, good for them, even better for us. So going through the printer, pulling out the information, took those usernames, fed it back in uh, to a brute forcer, and then looking for different accounts. So using like Medusa to test the accounts against a, a Windows server. Fortunate for us, um, they just went through an acquisition. So the new company that they acquired, or the new bank that they acquired, came in. A lot of the accounts were grandfathered in, so they didn't go underneath the same AD policy, which was awesome because then we were able to say, hey, look, we got access to workstation because somebody from this uh, acquired uh, bank that came in had a really crappy password, so we really easily guess it. Same, you know, same old story, Carlton Dance, yay, passing around hashes, get the DA token, bam, end of story. So let's go into a little bit more detail about this. A lot of times what we see is, you know, printers are set up, they don't restrict access to the management console. You can go across any environment, probably even here, and scan the network here and find a couple printers on the network, log into the admin interface. The HP job logs, um, they're used to be able to track users so they can build back for that expensive toner. So you can scrape those names out of there. You can use that information to your advantage. And then you can use tools like Medusa, Metasploit, whatever, you know, your favorite brute force tool. You can feed that user information into there and start doing some brute force attacks and, you know, have passwords fall out. And it's, you know, same old story, security tokens all over the place. So here's how we get the good. So here's an example of the HP printer. You'll see if you click on the color job log, oh, and by the way, this is all unauthenticated. You don't need to have credentials to access this information. They freely give it up. So here you can see the color job log information. You see the usernames. The other piece of information that's very helpful, especially if you get to the point where you want to start doing some uh, social engineering, is the job information. It tells you what application submitted that job. So here we see that, oh, they have Outlook. Well, let me try brute forcing against Outlook. Let's, let's use the Metasploit Outlook force module and take these usernames and see if anything falls through. And here's the example of the Xerox. And once again, we see, you know, we get the usernames and we get that additional piece of information that becomes very helpful to find out, hey, look, they're using Word and they're using Crystal Reports. 
there's been a lot of issues with Crystal Sports. And the same thing with Word. So if I wanted to attack them, so say the credentials aren't working correctly, so then I can start sending emails with attachments saying, hey, look, here's the you know, latest org chart in Word. Run this file, please. And bam, access. So now that we've kind of gone through the stories uh, of how we actually attack these things, what we did is a lot of it started as manual process. And we're like, oh, this sucks. We need to speed this up. We want to be able to rip through this stuff very quickly. So what we did is we developed a tool that kind of help automate a lot of this stuff and get the goods for us. And Daryl's going to kind of go into more information about like the tool, how it's structured, how to use it, and such. Thanks, Pete. So the tool's Preta, uh, which is Latin for plunder, booty, spoils of war. That's what that stands for. It's written in Perl. In spite of uh, Pete's dislike for Perl, it's written in Perl. Uh, current Preta version, I believe that's the current version, we enumerate up to 97 devices and models. So. This includes multifunction printers and various other embedded devices. Uh, the tool goes against uh, a number of appliances on the network. Uh, and the way, the way generally it works is it, it fingerprints information based on uh, title page. Because if you notice, everything we've done has been through basically the web interface. So we use that information. We use the title page, and we use the server type, and we also found out that all, all, all printers have SNMP enabled with public for most purposes. Uh, if you change it, you typically going to break all of your uh, drivers, so it's not going to get changed. And we can use those three pieces of things to enumerate most devices, or 90-some percent of the devices fairly accurately. So that's what we've been using. Uh, Pareto can be downloaded uh, from GitHub. That's it there, so it's easy. Just search for Pareto, and you'll find that out there. So this is how Pareto's uh, structure. It's it has three three core pieces, or actually four, there's three core pieces of the product. We have the dispatcher, which is the main Pareto.pl program. Uh, we also have a data file, and then we also have individual modules that are written. So it's a it's a framework, kind of a framework. And then what you need to do is you feed in your target list, and, and I'll show you the different methods for feeding the target list in there. So it takes the target list, it goes out and it validates, is that machine up? Is there a port 80 or whatever the web port is? Is it up? Is it running? And it goes, yeah. So then what it does is the fingerprint. It does the title page, the server type, quick SNMP. And then it compares that information it got back against a data file, which is a flat, flat file, but a database file, that lists the, those fingerprint data and the associated jobs. If it gets a positive hit, it'll call the associated Perl uh, module and it'll execute the tack against that. Uh, we get it, we get a little here in a little bit. I think we we'll probably have the time. We'll go ahead and uh, show a little more once the presentation. Or here in a minute, I'm going to show a little more on the tool. So Preta uh, options is you can feed GM map into it. You can feed a target file in there, individual IPs. You can also feed a CIDR straight in, you know, a slash 24 type thing into that, uh, or you can put a single IP in. Uh, for uh, the target file and the CIDR, you have to specify the port. That's, uh, that's why the GM map, the MMAP input is so much better, uh, because it parses that GM map data and identifies all web interfaces no matter what port they're on, and then uh, goes against them to validate what they are. And of course, it outputs, uh, you have to set up a project name, where it'll write everything, and then your individual jobs that you're going to run, and of course, it's SSL capable. So it outputs uh, a log file. The two main pieces is a log file and a webhost.txt uh, file, which is uh, information that it just fingerprint. It, all systems, it does that too. Uh, in the log file, it'll record things like passwords, SNMP data. Like uh, we have tax against some systems that uh, if they've if they've configured SNMP on the device, it's like an APC or I think it's a Liebert power management system. If they've configured SNMP for management but never bothered to change the password, we'll use that data to actually enumerate the SNMP settings off the device, which we can typically, if they're an SNMP shop, turn around and use against all their Cisco devices to pull running configs from. So it's a real, real great TAC uh, methodology. Uh, and then let's go ahead and look at some of them. to talk with both of these things here. Let's start that going. Let's 
So here's the two files here. Uh, this is, uh, hopefully we can see this okay. Probably not. I should zoom that up. Yeah. Crap, I don't even know what this application was that opened it with. I think that I don't think that'll make it bigger though. No. It's bigger. I can't even get out of this thing. You see that now? Okay, this is a, a, a typical um, log file output. So you can see it went through and it attempted various attacks on some stuff. Uh, if you've noticed, uh, this one here happened to be a passback attack against a sharp printer device, and it actually was able to pull the password. Uh, here's an example of uh, an APC pulling SNMP configurations from the device. And here we got to find that they're uh, SNMP uh, write community string was set to manager three for the community string, which came in handy for further attack. Uh, they were a big sharp shop, so we ended up getting uh, repeated passwords from those. Let's see what else we got access. Okay, this is uh, some various other devices. I can't even remember what this device is, but it actually was a, some kind of a hardware, firmware type thing. Oh, it was a remote access controller device, an IDAC, a Dell I, uh, information ID, IDRAC, ADRAC device. So you can see it attempted there, but it failed. I think one of them was successful, though. Because no matter what, somebody always misconfigures one of those in their environment and never fails. Right there it is, uh, IDRAC. So it tests for default creds on uh, management type systems also on the network. And it pretty much automates all of this. So that's a typical type of data that comes out of there. And then the other one that's interesting is it's every device that it actually uh, enumerated data from. So it goes through, it records the actual uh, IP address. It records the port that it enumerated data. It does the title page if there's one, the server type and then all the SNMP data also. So it makes it real quick for identifying other devices on the network that you may want to attack because you may not have modules for those. Uh, so it literally logs everything that has a web interface on the, on the network for you. So it also helps, like Daryl was talking about, identify other systems like you saw in there, there's a Tomcat system there. First thing you do is Tomcat, Tomcat. Get access to the uh, administrator console and deploy a WAR file, and I have access. So it helps you identify a large number of systems very quickly and be able to parse the data very quickly. So if there's like a specific uh, system that you're looking for, a specific software that you're looking for, you can easily search through the file and find that without having to parse through like a lot of data. You can just you know search it and because it's written out in such a fashion. Um, you get the IP address and you also get um, what the, the thing is. And you can also see like a lot of these under construction or ones that have you know authorized. Well, that means there's some sort of authentication there, so you can possibly gain other information from that authentication. So you can see it's a lot of information. So it returns a lot of valid information that can be used during uh, uh, assessments. Okay. I turn my mic on. Oh, my mic is on. Okay. So, so real quick on this, um, uh, a little bit, a little bit of history uh, on how this whole tool and everything worked out. That I think it's kind of interesting. 
is, uh, like I said, we started all this work in about 2010. So dealing with printer security, pen testing, uh, it turned out back in 2010 when we first started doing this as an attack method, we put a lot of effort into it. It wasn't just uh, once in a while. We started really looking at it. About 10 to 15 percent of the time, we we're able to gain some kind of user access by extracting uh, credentials off the multifunction printers. And once in a blue moon, one of the accounts will be a domain admin. It was fairly rare. So we move up to 2013, 2014, I guess. But 2013, uh, that access increased to 40, probably 45 to 50 percent of the engagements now. Uh, now, if I go into a shop that has like one printer and five employees, that, that's going to skew this. But when we're dealing with mid-sized companies, a company of 1,000 employees or higher, these numbers fit. 45 to 50% of the time, we're able to get Active Directory credits. Those lead to domain admin access through other methods about 25 to 30% of the time. Uh, we can gain direct domain admin creds about 5% of the time. So now, 5% of the engagements I go on, you know, we're able to gain domain admin information creds off these multifunction printers. So we have a future. We're moving forward. We got some cool stuff besides Credo that we're getting ready to do. I'm going to turn it over to Pete to do a quick discussion on the, the Metasploit direction. So <clears throat> we wrote Preda. It was good. It was great. But it was another tool that we had to run. Um, since Daryl and I spent a lot of our time, you know, most pen testers spent a lot of time using Metasploit. Why having another tool and then have to run that tool and then try to get the data into Metasploit because I like using Metasploit as my centralized database so I can search through stuff very easily, use a cred database and manage what credentials I have, all that kind of fun stuff. So Daryl and I sat around and we're like, oh, well, and it also, you know, includes beer most of the time when we get our ideas. Um, plus, plus we work for Rapid7. Yeah. So uh, shameless plug there. Um, so we decided, okay, let's let's start taking the Preda stuff and move it over into Metasploit. So we started working a lot of the converting a lot of the uh, Perl modules over into uh, Ruby and, and into Metasploit. So here's just kind of a, a quick example of a, a module here that scrapes uh, uh, the HP devices just looking for the usernames and pulls that out. Um, so why, why are we doing this? The reason behind it is it's much easier to maintain uh, Metasploit modules than it is the Perl modules themselves and there's less dependency issues. To install Preda there's a lot of uh, Perl modules so you're using CPAN and we all had fun with CPAN before and getting some of that stuff to work Always correctly. Always works fine for me. <laughs> um, we can easily update the modules too to store the information in like Metasploit's loop file or um, even integrate it into the creds database so we can store those credentials so we can also use those credentials then to brute force other things to see if there's uh, trust relationships that uh, can be taken advantage of. Um, and it's a lot easier for people to contribute. There are more contributors uh, to Metasploit than there are to Prager right now. Uh, so growing the community for it, adding more printers, making it easier for you guys to start feeding in additional information to the project and making like printers one of the things that, you know, my workflow right now when I get on site is start MMAP scanning, MMAP dump it to Preda, start, start working on it. And then I'm also doing like other things, but Preda is one of the first things I run when I start doing assessments now because, you know, we can see the, the rate of success that has gone up since 2010 to 2013. So with doing that, it's a lot easier to just have it run in Metasploit, have Metasploit do it, and get that information there. So you're not having to run another tool, not having to, to build a converter, which if people still want to use uh, the Preda, we are going to have a way that you can take that Preda output and then migrate it into Metasploit. So there will be uh, a script that you can run to populate the database with that information if you want it to run two tools. Otherwise, you can just run it within Metasploit itself. And last but not least, I mean, it, it's not in Perl. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to read. The, um, so when you submit module for Metasploit, fine, somebody man. gives it a review. I said my code's, my code's fine. I don't know, man. Um, so when we submit it with the Metasploit, we have people looking over the code, we have people testing it, um, and we're uh, making it much easier for other people to template. Line, template. Yes, yes, yes. So all these... So the question was, is it going to be in the community edition or if it's going to be in framework? Yeah, there'll it'll be framework modules, so it's not going to be part of the, you know, pro or, or whatnot. Um, because, you know, we want people to help develop this stuff. We want to put it in. It's going to be very, very similar to what you see now for, like, exploit and stuff like that. The modules just, you know, get update or uh, MSF update, however you update it, you'll start getting those. Yeah, not a whole lot of it has been converted over yet. We just started on it, and it's very time-consuming because we actually have to have access to the devices to be able to do anything with them to validate and write the tools. So it, it takes time for us to gain access to devices to be able to do that. 
Freda is going to be continued for probably at least another year, and then I'll probably start dying off. By that time, we'll have migrated everything over. We plan on we plan on releasing. Say we're planning on releasing um, two or three modules, uh, or including the one you just showed up there. It'd be like four modules uh, in June uh, at uh, Hack in Paris. So we're going to be releasing uh, modules actually in in the Metasploit by then, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, as Daryl was saying, we're going to release uh, modules that do the passback attacks. So this way, it's it's all automated. You have to set, uh, set up your own net client listener or whatever. You just run the Metasploit module, captures the credentials, writes it off to a file that you can use. Um, we're also working on the LDAP. Or, uh, I'm actually uh, the, the other one I'm working on right now is uh, sim similar to the um, the Canon one. We're going to release the Canon one, but I'm working on right now on Konica Minolta's that actually extract the SMB authentication passwords via SOAP messaging out of the device. You as a user don't have access to it, but it turns out that there are management tools actually interface with the printers uh, over SOAP messaging, not through the web interface. So you can't get nothing good through the web interface, but their management tool does. So we captured all that communication and figured out how it worked. Uh, and now Freight already has a module, but we're going to put that over in the Metasploit, and that will go in there, carry out authentication, SOAP authentication, SOAP transactions, and pull the password straight out of the system. So. And then we'll work on porting over a lot of the you know other 97 types of devices and getting that all into Metasploit. And then you know we'll constantly be adding new modules. We'll make it easy and have templates out there so you guys can you know quickly take the code, update it however you want for your printer, and then submit uh, the module. And we can start uh, leveraging uh, the community to help uh, add more additional modules to so, you know make poning people a lot easier with these printers. Yes. going to be aux mods because they're not really, there's not, uh, so with exploit code, right, you're, you're running some sort of payload. Now there may be one that uh, we'll talk about maybe in a little bit when we have time that may turn into an exploit, which is really cool what we're going to try to do with it, um, but mostly there's uh, the aux mods, so one's going to be a gather, one's the other uh, uh, scanners and stuff like that, so um, they're all, you're going to find them in an aux, uh, except for maybe one that we're going to work on that may be thrown under exploit. So uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is, okay, now that you know, we've seen all this stuff, you know, we're hacking it. How do we fix it? How do we secure it? How do we make it, you know, harder for people like us to come in and just pwn the crap out of it? Change the default passwords. Basic. Of course, I'll be able to get past half of that, but uh, it's a start. Patch the device. Because everything we've, almost everything we've talked about exploit-wise during this presentation that is a vulnerability has been patched in all the devices. Seriously, who, you know, raise the hands, who really patches their printers? Who thinks about patching firmware on a printer? How many changes the default passwords on their printers? So, that's, yeah. that's not too bad. Not too you all bad, work but... government? <laughs> Usually that's the only place I ever see it. It's government. They raise their hands. We change all passwords before they're deployed onto the network. Oh, but do you change the supervisor password? <laughs> <laughs> or do you apply the firmware to get for the uh, bypass? No. I don't think there's, uh, oh yeah, by, yeah. The cannons. There's no patch for the Xerox. No, not yet, but hopefully there will be. The newer versions <laughs> are fixed, but the old versions, they can't fix it. So like we're talking about patch management. Make sure that you're patching the firmware, uh, upgrading them. Um, and then the next one is, is kind of an interesting thing, which we'll, we'll get more into, um, is <laughs> disabling firmware upgrades. And Daryl can go yeah, into a little yeah. bit more detail. There, there's a reason why you want to disable firmware upgrades. There's a very really big reason. One, uh, there was an issue with HPs not too long ago where a college PhD student came up with methods. Of course, none of his code was released. He was a nice guy. Uh, so there's nothing out there. You'd have to reproduce it. On the other hand, I'm not a nice guy. Well, I think I'm nice, but considers how you look at it. And the Xerox, the Xerox work centrus, the large work centrus, the ten, twenty thousand dollar devices, uh, anything that's been manufactured in the last year, they changed the whole package signing method. So now it's, uh, you, you know, it's a public-private key type thing. Before it was all signed uh, internally with a single key that was the same on every device. Well, I pulled all that crap out of their firmware and actually uh, wrote an entire paper on how to build your own firmware. 
but we don't build the firmware. All you need to do is build the uh, bootstrap, which is just a shell program, and put, just put a bash shell in it. So I create this package with a bash shell in it, okay, as a firmware package, send it to the printer port, not to authenticate, send it to it as a print job, and have it kick back a reverse, a reverse shell with remote privileges or root privileges. So, so that opens so up. So that's why you want to. Oh, oh, yeah. The big thing is, is when you disable your firmware, also change your password. Because if you don't, I just log on and re-enable your firmware. So being able to get that reverse shell on a printer now gives you the ability to pivot through the printer. And so most, you know, even some of the, the most segmented systems that we've seen. A lot of these different segments all share the same printer. So now you have a pivot point. Now you can route through it. Yeah, the, uh, when I was actually working on this, I was being stalked by a bunch of Chinese because um, they heard that I was working on this. I was just It was a weekly type thing. I was getting these emails from these people coming up to me at conferences. I heard you're doing this because I talked about the work. Uh, and they, they, they stalked me for like three months until I released the white paper on how to do it. So... They're probably using it right now. Yes, sir. Oh, there's too many words in that question. Was this part of the uh, the, the Chinese hack against the government in 2011? Uh, correct. Yeah, I don't remember a whole lot about that. Uh, more than likely not directly related. Uh, I, the thing is, is a lot of these devices, these advanced devices, you can go in and do some really cool configurations. Um, you got time? Yeah, like, like HPs. You used to be able to go to HPs and actually configure them to point off to a command and control center. So you can point them off to a website and, or an FTP server somewhere else in the world, and they would sit there and go out and check for... Uh, PCL command instructions to carry out operations. So you can still do that with the number of devices out there. So, where are we at next? Oh, yeah, don't expose the internet. Was it exposed to the internet? Do you remember? Well, if it was, they got what they deserved. That's just stupid. Yeah, there's no reason to have your printer on the internet. I mean, Unless you you're just want, asking want, for it. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're hiring us to do an assessment, then just put your printer out there. Make it easy for us. Just make it easy. Uh, functional isolation is probably a big thing. Uh, I think so. You, you want to change your passwords. You want to uh, password password protect your printers. You want to turn off firmware stuff. And you also, critical printers, payroll, HR, stuff like that, people that the general population should not be using, actually need to be isolated so they can't physically get access through or, or internet access, web interface access. Isolate them. No one needs that stuff. No one needs to be able to print on those devices. They don't need to get access to the web interfaces on these devices. So I think it's cool to isolate these things. And I bring that up uh, real quick because of uh, I was at one company where they had a payroll printer and I was able to actually break into the payroll printer, pull credentials off of it for an account that the payroll department were the only ones were allowed to have. This was access to a single folder where payroll wrote payroll stuff and also the same folder where they backed up all of their financial databases, which I was able to pull off and extract all of their PII information for all their employees, all because of a printer. So if this would all have been isolated properly, those things probably wouldn't have happened. So that's probably a good thing. Um, okay, yeah, we're getting down toward the end here. You need a job? We're hiring. This is our 30 seconds of whore. Um, Rapid7 pen test team's actually hiring. Take a screenshot of that. Share it with your friends. Check it out. Uh, put in for a job if you're good. That's always helpful. We don't want people that aren't good. Everyone got that? All right. All right. So, questions? Yes, sir. Now, the question was, um, 
do I think the, the multifunction printers are uh, more or less of a, a security issue than other embedded devices that may exist on the network, correct? Is that your question? Uh, I think it's, damn. I, 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 you know what? I, I don't think it's more. I don't think it's less. I think it's, I'm very it's equal on them because we were able to extract critical data from all devices. If they're not properly configured or patched, any device on your network is a potential uh, threat. The, the, it's probably more of a risk purely from the fact that no printer ever gets its passwords properly changed or patched. And generally, a number of uh, embedded devices are more likely to have their default passwords changed. Yeah, and with the NASs and those types of devices, most of the time people are aware that there's sensitive information on those, so they do those extra steps where they change the passwords and change some of the SNMP strings. But with a printer, it's, you know, PC low letter. This is the only time if, you know, somebody looks at it. So it's, it's more of a set and forget type of situation where um, NASs and those types of devices um, have a little bit more security around them. But uh, some of the stuff like the HVAC systems, I mean, a lot of times uh, what happens is a vendor comes in in the environment, sets up the HVAC. They want to be able to remotely monitor it and make sure everything's uh, working because of their contracts. So they have default credentials. And the thing is, is they set those default credentials at one place. It's the same across other uh, companies that, like, we've seen where uh, one vendor has the same password across different customers that they support. So if you get that password, it'll work in other situations. And then we can pull additional information and stuff like that off the HVAC system via SNMP and then use that to access like the networking gear, like the Cisco gear and stuff of that nature. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What do device manufacturers do to to prevent you from, for me, us from hacking their firmware? You know what? To install firmware on a thing, one, you need to be able to do to validate yourself to the device. So some devices, uh, you don't need to validate yourself. You can just send it as a print job on Xeroxes. You can send it as a print job. It will upgrade the device. That's how it works. That's failed. Second, you need to have um, basically a good signing mechanism. So you can sign the packages so they can't be spoofed or built outside of the, you know, you'd have to have the private key to pull this off. And, and don't put the mechanism used to sign, don't put everything inside the package because it's easy to reverse. You pull it apart, you find all the different components, everything's in that one little package. So if you can capture it coming down, you know, the network, grab the firmware, extract it, you can kind of go through and see what it's being used. So like Daryl was saying, you know, kind of a public private key type of situation, using that to actually sign the packages and not put everything in that one binary. Which is what Xerox did to fix the problem that I pointed out. All of the new devices uh, require um, public private key signing type things. So. Yeah, and that's, that's how we found out how they signed is we took apart the binary and found how it was signing, what keys it used, what different values meant, and then just kind of reconstructed it and here we go, now we can create our own firmware updates. I think we're probably out of time. Thank you very much. We'll be outside too if you guys have any further questions or